Hey, Nick. Hey, Warwick. How are you going? Oh, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Don't be too nervous. It's okay. <laughs> We're about to fall into some stereotypes, I think. <laughs> no, actually, I, I've gone very safe today. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. I don't know if our guest is ready, but I'm ready. What kind of house weighs the least? No. A lighthouse. Oh, that is very good. Not even, you not, <laughs> didn't even have a slight stab, Nick. No, they were too mean. I wasn't going. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted the guests to actually like, stick around and record the episode with us. Oh, uh, dear. Matthew Rosie, welcome to the podcast, mate. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, <laughs> my joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's all up from here. So now, can I call you Matt, or is or do you prefer Matthew? Yeah, Matt's fine. Matt, okay, I don't know an Australian Matthew that's not called Matt. Uh, it would be pretty rare, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, Matt, uh, you're not you're not just a real estate agent. Uh, we've had a bit of a pre chat before we hit record, um, yeah. and and you are in an area that. I think a lot of people think they know more than they really do about real estate, uh, particularly tradies. I reckon tradies fancy themselves as property investment, mm, I wouldn't say gurus, but uh, at least competent and reckon they could do it. And unfortunately, in my past life or one of my past lives as a financial advisor, I saw lots of people, especially tradies, especially builders, get themselves into all sorts of strife uh, with their choices. So um, but before we dive in into the tin tax today, Matt, um, can you tell our listeners a bit more about you and how you got to be, you know, a world-famous uh, property investor and buyer's agent, Matt? Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, I probably wouldn't say I'm world-famous, but uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my name's Matthew, obviously, um, of Rosie and Rosie, and, um, being my last name. Um, uh, the other Rosie is my sister, Kate. Um, we provide uh, property management and um, investor advocacy services here in Adelaide. Um, I started uh, investing in real estate when I was in my early 20s. Um, uh, the first one wasn't necessarily meant to be an investment, but uh, it did certainly put me on a journey. Um, what a little two bedroom. Creek and brick walk up unit, which uh, was very colourfully painted by the previous owner, and, and um, <laughs> yeah, I just neutralised it basically, gave it a bit of a paint job, and I think we replaced the carpet and uh, vinyl flooring, which was just uh, in a roll back then. It wasn't these fancy paints that you have now, um, and yeah, uh, improved the value of it, and um, through through that, I think that wet wet my appetite for real estate so um i ended up doing uh well kate and i both did our certificate in real estate um at the real estate institute and um yeah had intended to go into a traditional real estate um professional um, environment working for you know a local agency which i had work lined up. Kate was actually already working in, in property management, so she was really just getting the, the ticket that she needed. Um, whereas I was looking to get into the industry, seeing the, uh, uh, you know, I, th- what I thought was a, a lucrative opportunity. And uh, it was doing that certificate that I met um, a chap who was doing um, investment uh, advisory services, which, uh, as it turned out, was actually project marketing. So uh, your listeners might have um, come across Sprookers in their time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I found myself working in one of those firms um, and uh, thought we were doing the right thing. It was certainly uh, aligned in, in many ways to what I um, was trying to achieve through through real estate and, and using it as a vehicle to create wealth. But um, yeah, it worked out that uh, it's, it's it's much more about selling a project off market than it is about helping people create wealth. So, yeah. um, so Kate and I decided to start Rosie and Rosie and offer, uh, I guess, a service that was more focused on the uh, the investor and what was appropriate for them, rather, rather than the one size fits all option, which uh, comes with the Sprookers. Um, and yeah, it was I think a you know complementary 
joining of our two backgrounds um and yeah that's what we've been we've been doing since so helping people who want to invest in property do so with confidence and then uh, helping them to manage that property and um and grow their wealth through uh, building a portfolio nice. if you you're based in adelaide does that mean that the kind of work that you do is strictly within adelaide or do you look outside of adelaide depending on the opportunity we uh, we would sooner introduce someone to one of our peers in in another city or state um, than pretend to know everything that's yeah. going on everywhere. Um, I know there's there's borderless buyers agents, and that's you know it's up to them. But we prefer to be really niche and really focused on on our local market. So for us, it's all about just looking after people who want to invest in Adelaide um and introducing them if they do want to diversify interstate to to people who we trust interstate doing the same love that what do we need to know about investing in property i felt like i could just go and buy a house it was cheap i could do exactly what you did matthew in the first place a mm-hmm. little bit of a cosmetic reno flip it off do it again time and time i'd build my money up but i don't think it's quite that easy anymore yeah look, you could probably buy anything and if you held it for long enough you'd, you'd make some money but in the meantime, perhaps you could have used your money more wisely, had it working harder for you. Um, we we find a lot of people get um, stuck by focusing on location first, um, whereas that generally leads you know, leads people into this rabbit hole of you know looking for the next hotspot, mm-hmm. um, and then if they don't give up. They they might get to the point of actually looking online at domain and real estate dot com and, and looking at properties you know in or around the the hotspot that they've identified or hotspots and then they end up getting overwhelmed by the choice of, of properties and starting mm-hmm. to question um, themselves with uh, things like you know uh, do I buy a three better or four better or do I buy a unit or do I buy something that I can subdivide or add value to or um, you know, am I just too late? Um, and, and again, the questions become overwhelming and, and that information overload uh, becomes frightening and people just don't act. And so we we like to hold people's hands through that process and, and through a, a spending more time up front um, in the early stages, take, take options off the table. Um, there's, a, there's a good saying that I, I use with um, our clients uh, that I attribute to Abraham Lincoln um, that goes along the lines of, you know, if I was given six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first four sharpening the axe. And um, and so, yeah, we take we take an approach which starts with the individual or individuals if it's a husband and wife or partners, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. Um which, uh, yeah, I think is a prudent way of, of investing and helps to take away some of the distractions that, mm-hmm. that might come with trying to focus on the location first. So, yeah. Makes so, sense. <laughs> both very, very good. I'll let you jump in because otherwise I'll just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, cut him off. <laughs> Got it. No. There you go. Okay. Uh, so, Matthew, if it's not location, what is it? How do I choose a property if I'm not going to buy in a hotspot? Isn't that how I make my money? Yeah, so there's there's a, there's a spectrum of of strategies that that people can, I guess, um, be aligned with or should focus their their efforts on. And at one end of that spectrum, you've got your very passive buy and hold strategy: just buy something and wait. Um, and then as you move through, you might have something that you, you can add some value to. So manufacture some some equity or some value through a superficial renovation. And then it might be a bit more advanced where you've got a more of a structural renovation or an extension. And then as you go further along, you might have a subdivision. And then I guess at the other end of that spectrum is your, your full-blown development, buying a site and, and you know, maybe putting a medium or high-density development together. Which, um, you know, there, there's there's definitely opportunities across that whole spectrum, but with with the higher rewards, which comes at the the more aggressive end of that spectrum, you've got much higher risks. And I think you know where a lot of people um, underestimate things is is the risk that's involved, but also their abilities 
a lot of people overestimate their abilities. Uh, and I know your audience being tradies might find that somewhere in the middle of that spectrum is is maybe the most appropriate space for them. If they can add value through their, their own abilities, then, then that could be a very effective strategy for them. Um, but yeah, one of the things that we, we like to do in the first stages of you know planning and, and getting ready to, to, to go to the market is finding out um, you know what their goals are and if they're realistic and if they're shared by their partner, if a partner's involved in this this journey, um, their appetites for risk. We want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. It's a lot harder for someone to come up out of their comfort zone than it is for someone to sort of step back um, just so that they're, they're matched together. Mm-hmm. Um, and finding out that those goals, you know, are they are they realistic? Mm. Do they have, I guess, the the physical abilities to do whatever it is they want to achieve? Um, do they have the financial ability or capacity to do it? Because a renovation might mean borrowing money and not having any income through the period that you're renovating it for. Um, and the availability of themselves, their time, can they put the time into doing a renovation or even if it's a simple buy and hold strategy, do they have the time to be doing the research and doing the due diligence and inspecting properties and so on that uh, that's required for even the most passive type of investment? So as as you go through that spectrum, all of those requirements increase. So financial capacity is much, much larger. The time that they need to put into it is much higher. Um, physically, you may not need to be, you know, if you're doing a full development, you may not be out there, you know, building these houses but yeah in in any sort of renovation space which i think a lot of people are attracted to being either of a trade background or just through seeing how easy it appears on the the reality tv shows <laughs> uh, you can do it in a weekend yeah and look it is perhaps one of the most tax effective investment strategies where you you buy a house that you know you can add some value to you move into it it's your actual primary residence mm. and you know you, you add the value and you get it you know um revalued or you you sell it for a profit and you, you avoid i guess the capital gain tax that would come you know if that was actual investment property mm. um that is a very effective strategy for some people but um you need to be careful that you don't bite off more than you you can chew mm. um and that also, if you repeat that process, the ATO might question whether or not this is a genuine, you know, upgrade of your properties or whether you are actually in the space of developing. Mm-hmm. And so you, you may get caught out. But if you hold the properties for long enough, you know, live in them for that period of time, then uh, that can, can be a very powerful strategy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not for everyone. Um, I usually ask, you know, when we're asking people to think about their goals, where are they in their stage of life? Because if if, if you're a young tradie with lots of energy and lots of time, you, that might be a really good strategy. But what if your partner and you decide maybe we want to have a family in the next few years? Because renovating around kids is <laughs> it, it, it's it's a disaster. It, it's really you've got to park the whole idea really, in my opinion, mm. um, to safely and effectively renovate. You kind of need to be free kids or well and truly post kids. Yep. So, yeah, helping people work through all of these options is, is, is really important in our opinion, and that's why I guess we, we do, I guess, focus our, our, um, our positioning in the marketplace as being really niche to investors rather than um, you know, a, a buyer's agent which can service everyone. We really prefer to work with investors and help them get really clear on these goals and and start to yeah take off those distracting um, options from the table. Matthew, how do you then find the stock to service the requirement? So, you know, being in the position you're in, I presume there's a whole bunch of industry knowledge that you have, so that you're not necessarily relying on domain or real estate dot com. You'd You'd have your connections, of course. Um, h- how do you go about finding the right properties for the right people? They, I, I imagine that's far more complicated than I think it probably is. 
you might be surprised. Um, certainly, um, one of the first things we do once we've got a very clear brief, and that's what we, you know, we talk about um, in, in those early sessions, is, is getting really clear on the the type of property, the maximum we want to spend, how liquid our deposit is, because the right, pro- right property might pop up tomorrow. We want to be able to make a, an offer quickly. Um, and yeah, so once we've got a really clear brief, we can set some alerts up in its software um, or directly in realestate.com and domain, which will make us aware when a property hits the market. But at the same time, by that stage, we'll have identified a few areas mm-hmm. that might generate the type of property that we're looking for. And we will contact the agents who are active in those areas. Yep. And we'll make them aware that we've got a client um who is in a position to make a strong offer really quickly ready to move we're not limited to just those that are um vacant or you know we're we're open to buying something that has an existing tenant in it um which opens a few doors because some agents are working with vendors or hopefully working with vendors Mm -hmm. um just waiting for that right opportunity and it could be that they can pull a vendor onto the market or at least, you know, get them from sitting on the fence to being open to sell when they don't have to go through that whole rigmarole of, you know, moving a tenant out or preparing the house for sale, doing the photos, staging the home and all that sort of stuff. So Mm -hmm. it's about making those agents aware Mm -hmm. Um, and also the property managers. Property managers um, are often a really good contact Mm -hmm. because they – they're in probably more frequent contact with those landlords and they might even, you know, have an inkling as to that landlord's desire to sell. Yep. Um, so, yeah, we reach out to all of our contacts and we, we're always, you know, introducing ourselves to new people, um, um, yeah, mortgage brokers, financial planners, accountants. It, it's, it's sometimes funny who might, you know, generate um, an off-market opportunity. And then, of course, once you start making these contacts, especially with the agents, um, we just start to receive off-market opportunities. And often an off-market opportunity could be a free market opportunity rather than a genuine off-market opportunity, yeah. which is, yeah, kind of different. Um, it still can beat, you know, a pre-market opportunity could beat something that's on the market in terms of the competition that you're fighting with to, to secure the property. So, um, yeah, my phone, I put it on airplane mode now because I'm, I'm always getting text messages and, and phone calls, um, you know, with these pre-market, you know, inspections and opportunities to go and check them out. But um, I guess once you've been doing it for long enough, um, yeah, the, the opportunities sort of um, become a little bit easier to find. But, um, yeah, I've got a, a, a dedicated um, email for giving to agents because I'll just get spammed with <laughs> all the new listings that they've got. Yeah, um, ideal for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I jump in there occasionally when I, uh, when I need to find um, something that, that might fit a client's brief, but mm-hmm. more often than not it starts um, once we get that clear brief and we start to, to make those inquiries and reach out to our contacts. So um, I think you made a good point, Matthew, that, um, people sometimes underestimate what's involved. And I'm pretty sure we've all met someone or heard a story from somebody that was like, yeah, I bought this property and all I did was, like you were saying before, right, all I did was put new floor coverings, chuck a coat of paint on it, clean up the gardens and made a hundred grand, mate. Uh, and it's, you know, it's at a barbecue or a family gathering or something. I think a lot of people get sucked into the, the quick win and um, I come from a background, you know, in financial planning where shares and managed funds, same conversations. Everybody had a story about, oh, I bought these shares and, you know, I've made, I've made 20 grand on them in four months. And so people go in with that expectation. Yep. Crypto. So, <laughs> <laughs> case in point. Yeah. Um, and so they go in with these unrealistic expectations. I'm interested to know how you manage that without people going, well, you're a wet rag. I'm going to find someone who believes in my dream. Yeah. Yeah. And look, I I, I do sometimes pop people's bubbles, um, <laughs> but I, I usually try and warn them. Um, <laughs> when we spend that time 
in you know before we go looking at, at properties we spend a lot of time really analyzing their their goals and making sure that they're realistic and it's it's pretty easy to do with real estate but i usually do warn people you know that that we may have to um modify our expectations but also i remind them that our goals can change as 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 life goes on you know we get older we get job promotions we come into more money through inheritance or the opposite you know our partner or, or someone in the family may have an illness or pass away and divorce kids you know all of these things can have an effect on 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 the journey and so what what we agree on or, or yeah, the decision we come to with that first property is just for that first property it's appropriate pointing them in the right direction for the time that they're in at the moment when it comes to doing second property we go through the entire process again mm. and, and just see what's changed because often you know all these little things change and like i said people come into money equity happens in their own homes and or investment properties um you know, job promotions or change of industry all these things can can add to um the plus side but then equally we can have things that that kind of contribute to lowering their borrowing capacity or changing the direction of their their goals and sometimes selling their their investment might be the right thing for them at that time so um yeah does that answer your, your question i've forgotten what it was exactly now how do you how do you burst people's bubbles yeah yeah all data it's really it's it's in the the recent comparable sales so you know where can you buy something that's you know under five hundred thousand dollars and gives you a six hundred dollars a week you know, rent return. Well, you know, let's pull up realestate.com and see where that where that's happening. Mm. Sorry, we we <laughs> can't find it. Um, and so, yeah, that I guess I'm. Yeah, I, I I can show people data and and really make make things realistic. Once we get past that and we we get into this you know realistic sort of space, then we can kind of create this hypothetical. Um, uh, image of or parameters for an investment property and we can go okay well this is realistic if we have a purchase price of this and we can get a rent return of this then we might have this much as a gap when you take into consideration all your in, you know ingoings and outgoings and whatnot tax benefits and depreciation um we can go right this is achievable mm. so now where can we find that and have the capital growth that we want to you know try and explore or achieve so we can then really go then we can start looking at locations mm. so until this point we're still talking really hypothetical high level analysis and um but yeah once we have that that much clearer uh, parameter and realize where our limitations are then we can kind of go okay well, where will this work mm. and then we can we can really sharpen our focus on that area yeah data data pops the bubble for me yeah I think, speaking of data um, yeah. given that you guys have the other side of the business with the property management as well, I'm only going to talk about Queensland because it's where I live and what I know, but I've yeah. seen a lot of nervous investors with a bunch of changes that have come into effect in Queensland with mm. things like, um, the rent is fixed now for 12, well, you can only change it once in a 12 month period, I think. And then there's some other new complications that are coming in. So it's a, it's a more nervous or apprehensive market than I've seen before, with the property management side of your business, are you advising, you know, like how do you even come up with a fixed rate for rent for 12 months when you don't know what your variable interest rate is going to do and, and you don't want to rip the tenant off, or at least I wouldn't as an investor. I'm sure there are plenty that do. That seems like a really complex um, road to navigate with someone so that your relationship is ongoing and you have the opportunity to for them to then come back and work with the service again. That That seems like it could be a... A complicated part of what you do yeah it is it, it really is complicated because um when you i guess look after your tenants and, and keep the rent as as low as you could you can manage um there, there comes a point where yeah things like well interest rate rises in a row really starts to, to bite and there's nothing worse than seeing someone who sells a property because it's hurting too much to hold it and you know they, they look at the the price of that property that they sold five years ago and what they would have had today if they just hung on to it. So, um, yeah, we, we, we navigate, I guess, what current market um, rents we could achieve for that property by looking at similar 
properties that have rented recently or are currently on the market and balance that with, I guess, the, you know, the, the, the relationship we've got with the tenant. Um, we don't want to, I guess, lose a good tenant because then we open up ourselves to the unknown in some ways. And we can do a lot of due diligence up front with, you know, trying to find and screen applicants for a, a rental property. But we just, as of the 1st of July, had some rental reforms, the first time in two decades or longer since they came out, um, which has really um, changed the landscape quite a lot. So, um, yeah, we, we can't change the rent more than once every 12 months or once from the last increase. Um, we could, we're we really limited now in what we can actually ask a tenant in their application, meaning wow. we, we can be opening up ourselves to um, – some some uncertainties. Thankfully, the, the property management community in, in Adelaide is very strong and very yep. tight. So we don't like to see each other get, um, I guess, a, a tenant that has perhaps had not had the best experience with their previous landlord or property manager. Um, and certainly tenants who apply um, and have only lived at home or in private rentals um, will get generally put on the, the the B list before they get looked at because we we trust the word of of our fellow yeah. property managers in the industry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is a delicate balancing act, and it's important to sort of try and keep as close to market um, rents as as you can because otherwise, if you have to play catch up, um, that increase might be seen as uh, unfair. Mm. And if it's challenged and it goes to say the tribunal, then the tribunal may um, may say, look, that's not a reasonable increase and there's no real parameters. So this makes it really awkward. Um, it'd be much easier if they just said increases can only go up in line with inflation or, yeah. you know, by no more than 10%, whatever. But at the moment, it's all open to interpretation and, and being able to justify an increase. So when we have to break the news to our tenants, we usually explain that, you know, this is due to you know, obviously increased costs, but also market market rents. And so um, it's often harder to argue when they – often what happens as a tenant, they'll get the rent increase uh, or the offer to renew with the rent increase and they'll jump online and have a look and see what, what else is out there and they might go, you know what, we're actually better staying put. Yeah, mm. it's, it's certainly a challenging time. I don't think it matters which camp you're in as the investor or the, the tenant. It, I feel yeah. that it's um, – uh, challenges to be navigated ahead with these rental reforms, all of which that can be, of course, assisted with having the right people in place to help you navigate some of those challenges. I certainly, right this moment, am pleased that I am not navigating any of those challenges. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's not surprising that following a rent increase, um, uh, tenants' patience becomes a lot shorter um, for things like maintenance. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, the expectation is is much higher on getting maintenance seen to than, than it was pre-rent increase, which is completely understandable. Mm. Mm. So that's where our trainees come in again and it provides them with another fantastic opportunity. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. As long as they get onto it quickly. <laughs> so, oh, that <laughs> T- tenants don't have a lot of leverage, unfortunately, and the one thing that they do have is withholding rent, which yeah. is not – you know that's a breach of of their lease to withhold rent while waiting for uh, for maintenance. But sometimes they feel that that is the only way they're going to get um, listened to and, and action. So, yeah, it's it's been an interesting um, last few years, really, as as uh, labour shortages have meant it is harder to get, you know, especially small jobs done because everyone's busy, everyone's got work, and and no one wants to sort of lose, uh, you know. Of days wages by going and doing a one hour job and, and having to drive across town to do it. So, yeah, those small jobs are getting a lot more painful. That's right. Yes. When the government starts meddling in uh, pricing for industry, um, I think this causes all sorts of problems that they are unable to manage. And they just leave it to you to figure it out, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, 100% was the. Uh, you know, at the moment, the government has uh, put an incentive on the table, um, you know, free stamp duty or waiving the stamp duty for new home buyers. Um, it was previously capped uh, at a certain value. Uh, I think they've lifted that cap now, which makes it, um, I guess, more attractive to more people. But it, 
and it is link, linked to new homes. So they either have to build the home or buy a home that is newly built. But it's not really adding to the supply as much as it is adding to the demand. And so, yeah, the, the real problem is, is supply. So mm-hmm. it seems every time the government at any level, state or federal, tries to do anything to, to help, they, they, they end up driving more demand, which only has one impact on house prices, which is an inflation about. and cost of living and, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> the three of us, I'm sure, could run the country much better. <laughs> of course we <laughs> Yeah, a couple of beers, we'll, we'll sort it out. <laughs> a couple of pinos. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Some big fat uh, South Australian reds would fix it all. <laughs> um, Matt, I have a question that I love to ask most of our guests, <clears throat> and, and I'm fascinated to hear your response to this one today. If you had a thousand trade business owners in a room, what's one piece of advice you would love to leave them with? When it comes to property investment, I'm assuming. Anything you like, mate. It could be about, you know, be kind to your mum or something. Right. Oh, this is a good one. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to real estate, one of the pieces of advice that I often give people is, you know, don't, don't wait to buy real estate. Buy real estate and wait. And that's not really limited to um, tradies that uh, I think, yeah, I've seen a lot of people think they can time the market um, and often, yeah, it, it's hard. They say there's, there's cycles, um, but there's also you know, there's, there's cycles within cycles. There's every, Everywhere is doing something different at any given time. So yeah, just right. um, get in there when you, when you can and you're comfortable. But, um, yeah, make sure you, you spend that four hours sharpening the axe. It's, I guess, my biggest Piece of advice. Both very good pieces of advice, Matt. Thank you. Love it, Matt. Um, Now, if somebody wants to go and uh, check you out uh, or perhaps uh, have a chat to you about um, getting into the property market, Matt, what's the best place for them to do that? Yeah, I'd love to to hear from anyone who's uh, who's heard us on the podcast. Um, Best place to go is is to the website, rosieandrosie.com.au. Head to the contact page. We've got a very cool Calendly link in there, which um, I only discovered probably about 12 months ago, but it's been a real um, game changer in terms of um, yeah making time for people to uh, to catch up and have a chat because it links straight into the back end of my calendar. They can pick a time that suits them and it's locked in. We're not playing tag, um, trying to lock, lock in a time. Um, and it's, it's funny. I know it works because I get, I go to bed and then I wake up in the morning and I've got you know new appointments in the calendar. So clearly people are on their phone at night. Yeah. Now, I think <laughs> this is a good idea. And and the fact that they're able to jump in and, and the time that suits them. Uh, very very good. So yeah, find the find the, the contact page on the on the website and um yeah, book that time. Love it. Matthew. Well Matt, thanks for being on the podcast and sharing some tips and uh some uh Funny stories, I guess, um, and a few warnings about real estate. Uh, I'm off to check out where the next hotspot is and um, throw some cash at it after all that. <laughs> but thank you guys for, for having me. And um, yeah, hope, hopefully it was helpful. Uh, next time you're in Tassie, mate, look me up and we'll uh, go and have a light red together. Uh, yeah, I'll hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Likewise, mate. if you're over in Adelaide anytime, let me know. Love to uh, catch up. Love a love a South Australian red mate. So we'll do. <laughs>